The battle droid legions of the CIS endlessly assaulted the galaxy during the Clone Wars, challenging the Republic across known space. Though the Republic controlled significant territory, CIS foundries allowed the Separatists to quickly militarize as the faction fielded trillions upon trillions of battle droids. That being said, there were several serious flaws within the CIS which prevented its droid army from being truly great, even with its incredible size. I alluded to this in a recent video, but I think it's worth a bit more of a deep look, which is what we'll be doing today. Specifically, I've identified three or four deficiencies in the droid army that I'd like to discuss. Now, of course, it's hard to really pin these criticisms on the CIS itself, as almost every aspect of the war was engineered and controlled by by Palpatine, and that includes, at times, weakening the CIS. Nonetheless, we'll evaluate the army from an objective perspective. Just pretend that we're trying to reshape the CIS army into something better. What issues would we notice, and how would we fix them? The Confederacy's biggest issue is the over-reliance on a heavily flawed B-1 battle droid model. The B-1 was ultimately a near totally ineffective weapons platform, which, even when thrown wave after wave at enemies, was dispatched by far superior clones. And the average clone, which is the base soldier of the Republic, could destroy dozens of B-1 battle droids. Although the B-1 was cheaper, the comparative inefficiency was not offset by the difference in cost. I've talked about why I think this is. The first thing I'd like to point out is that the B-1 served as not only the base for the droid army, but the B-1 occupied the majority of non-leadership positions within all of the Separatist military. Not only combat roles, but logistics, operations, etc. What does this mean? Well, the platform thus, which serves as the basis for your army, also needs to be able to, say, type at a computer, or fire a capital ship weapon, or perform a bunch of other tasks. This manifests in, for example, two arms, which, besides for holding a weapon, are pretty useless in combat. And in designing a pure fighting droid, we would probably incorporate the weapons within the arms itself, just like we see with the B-2, the destroyer droid, and really most other battle droid models. This is just one example, and generally I'm saying keep the B1s, but remove their combat programming and stick them in non-combat roles. This makes sense, I think, for a bunch of reasons. The CIS military policy was built around its supposed disposable and cheap droid army. However, almost by definition, a droid needs to reach a certain level of sophistication to operate advanced machinery. Want a disposable army? Okay, take a stick, add a set of legs, and give it a gun. Boom. Disposable, cheap, and probably more effective than a B-1. As a side benefit, the other B-1s are also probably now better at their non-fighting jobs. Regardless whether you agree with everything I just said, I think it's clear that having the base of your droid army, and that's trillions upon trillions of droids, made up of a machine not 100% optimized for combat is a big mistake. This ties into the larger issue of inefficiency. Just because something is cheap doesn't mean that it has to be garbage. Despite having a wide range of personal quirks, battle droids do not, for example, move Move tactically or use cover consistently, and their main strategy is to throw themselves at the enemy. The lack of real cohesive movement, I think, is their weakest point, as mobilizing your large army is the key to victory, or else the Republic just ends up fighting a bunch of smaller battles, not having to face the full brunt of the horde. I think the deficiency here stems from both poor programming, which I'm sure is related to the problem I just discussed, but also the lack of a central command. The Trade Federation and the CIA CIS's response to the loss at Naboo was too drastic in my opinion. I'm talking of course about the removal of droid control ships. Yes, not having a single kill switch for your droids is nice, but losing the coordination offered is a huge loss. The destruction of the droid control ship over Naboo was a fluke. Lucrahulks, especially after the Clone Wars era refit, were not only incredibly powerful, but in the vast majority of cases, the largest ship on any battlefield. In most cases, they should be able to survive and continue coordinating troops on the ground. But I think a better option, even though expensive, would be to maintain the ability to operate independently or, if present, link with a droid control ship. 
To be honest, I'm not sure about the lore here. That may have been how B1s and other battle droids actually operated during the Clone Wars. If so, Lucre Hulk control ships should have been used much more commonly, and droid armies should have been commanded by multiple intelligent droids, which could have coordinated attacks across a planet. We see some level of B1 communication and even coordination during the Clone Wars, but we don't see the type of planet-side minute control that I'm talking about here. Controlling your droids from afar gives you basically instant communication, total expendability of your soldiers, which combined with a lack of morals or survival instinct should be an enormous advantage. So basically, you get instant communication and coordination, plus you get rid of the quirks the B1 develops when away from a droid control ship. Obviously, larger droid models, like even B2s, should probably be given more creative freedom, perhaps being totally detached from the command ships, but they make up for that by being more expensive, and thus having better programming and processing power. Speaking of advanced droid models, we see the CIS fail to effectively use their technical achievements. Back to the B1, as countless new battle droids entered service, the B1 not only remained the exact same, but continued to serve as the separate main foot soldier. This makes no sense. If you don't want to replace the droid, at the very least, incorporate the upgrades you've been developing into the machine. A base B1 can be made deadly, as we see in canon with Mr. Bones and Legends. Making incremental changes in the model through the lessons learned in other droid development would have taken the CIS pretty far. It also seems like the Confederacy had countless projects which were over-localized, i.e. research wasn't shared, and effective prototypes were lost if the Republic managed to destroy a specific factory. As an example, for some reason, with a single exception, the super tank saw no recorded action after the Second Battle of Geonosis. We see the same thing with the Defoilator, another great vehicle which would be very difficult to counter. It's not hard to put vehicle plans on a ship, send them to droid factories for mass production. Besides, for the presence of Sidious, this probably didn't happen because the various Separatist sub-factions were competing for superiority, but imagine an army of super tanks with DDT artillery support, then also throw in a few Cortosis battle droids. Good luck. To the Galactic Republic. But the final thing I'd like to talk about is generally a poor strategic and tactical use of the droid army. This starts at the design and production level. Droids offer so much flexibility. Your frontline troops could be tiny suicidal bugs which run towards an enemy and explode. Your tank could all be awesome creations like the Octoptara tri-droid with no need for a pilot or a command module. Yet the CIS still uses humanoid frontline soldiers and has tanks driven by other droids. It just makes no sense. Of course, we do see some really interesting and effective designs. For example, having essentially a walking tank starfighter hybrid with the droid starfighter is super cool, as is the droid gunship, which is not only a top of the line atmospheric fighter craft, but also a troop transport. However, even with these assets, the droid army still commonly falls into maneuvers you'd expect from organic armies. Now, this also isn't universal. We see at the Battle of Kamino for example, that droids attacked the planet in a way that organic beings just couldn't, but it was pretty infrequently that the Separatists actually managed to think outside the box. And this isn't related to just tactics, but on a grander strategic level as well, I wonder why the CAS, for example, didn't often take advantage of the fact that their army could be grown without fresh troops. The Dark Empire used world devastators, which could turn material into starfighters or other weapons. As the Separatists, I would have focused more on on miniaturizing my factories, and every planet I had a presence on, even the ones I'm attacking, would have served as a garrison, with factories pumping out new troops. My issue here is the same. The Confederacy failed to think of novel or non-traditional battle tactics. And those are the major flaws that kept the Separatist army from being great, but that's just my opinion. As always, was I too harsh? Did I get it mostly right? Or are there serious instances of either good or bad Separatist behavior that I've missed? Let me know all of that in more down in the comments. Today's question comes from Ricardo, who asks about Spartan 2 numbers, and specifically, why did the numbers go up to 150 if there were only 75 original candidates? Well, there were actually multiple Spartan 2 classes, at least in probably only two. We know that of the first 75 Spartans, about 30 survived. We don't know how many were inducted in the second class, and to be honest, I've never heard the 150 number before. Thank you for the question, though. If you want me to answer something you're wondering, make sure to comment down below with 
the hashtag AskEck, which really improves my chances of seeing the question. Until next time guys, this has been Eckhart Slatter. May the Force be with you.